a privilege to be here today. What a privilege to be invited to share God's word. I feel a bit emotional just about being here. The title I've been given is uh, Looking Back, Looking Forward, or a subtitle I've given it, The Key to the Past, The Key to the Future. And I'm just wondering if the key that we've used in the past isn't the same key to use into the future. You've heard the saying, when you're on a good thing, you stick to it. Well, if the lock in the door hasn't been changed, you use the same key. But some things do change. We started in a tin cathedral, Ray Batch's tin shed, went to a scout hall, then to... West Beach Primary School, Grange Primary School, and then to the church home here at Frederick Road. But I've observed that even changes have occurred here. We used to have wood panelling at the back of the stage, now it's curtains and black paint. The foyer looks great, used to be bricks, now it's a plaster bond. Fashions change. We used to wear suits and ties to church every Sunday and now we've casualed down. The big change, guys' haircuts. <laughs> I'm not going there because I'm probably going to offend. <laughs> Some things don't change. God does not change like shifting shadows. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus has and will always be good, gracious and glorious, loving, loyal and likeable, caring, charismatic and considerate, faithful, friendly and full. Full of what? Full of grace and truth. Heard this quote? Methods change often, but the message never does. I might say never should. Methods may change, but the message stays the same. What is the message? The truth that does not change. I'm going to answer that shortly. For now, I want to address three keys to our past and three keys to our future. Remember an elderly minister coming to church and saying, as a young man, his problem was he didn't know what to preach. But as an older man, he said he didn't know what not to preach. I understand and feel like he did as an older man these days. There are, in fact, keys to survival and keys to revival. I'm going to mention three of them, and they're probably the three foundational keys, I think, to our survival and revival. Key number one, God. Without God, without hope. That's stating the obvious, I know. But I humbly said at the 40th celebration that I believe I know the key to revival. I believe I know the key to revival. Come to me, Mark 3.20, come with me. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered. I think that's it, guys. I think that's the key to revival. Have Jesus in your house. God's presence is both essential and attractive. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of scriptures just like this, New Testament the same. Isaac asked the question, why have you come to me? The answer they gave, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. New Testament, we're told in Corinthians, if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes into the church service, they will fall down and worship God. I missed a bit out. And what's that? Why do they fall down and worship God? It says because they will discern God is really among you. See, it's God's presence that makes the difference. Moses got it right. Remember God said to him, Moses, I want you to lead my people into the promised land. He said, God, I don't want to do it. I won't do it unless you go with me. 
and God answered and said, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. See, Moses knew that it was only God's presence and favour that would enable Israel prosperity and peace. Same today. Verse 14 said, and I love this, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. See, if God be for us, who can be against us? We don't have to scheme and strive if God is with us. Why and how? If God be for us, who can be against us? Just an addendum to this point, I'd like to include this. It is true that a crowd can be gathered without God, but in the end, what's the profit? Numbers are not the all-important thing. I would rather be with the minority that's got it right than the majority that's got it wrong. I'd just like to toss that bit in. How do we get God to be with us? What did Moses do? He said, God, I don't want to go anywhere without you. He asked him. We invite him. Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, eat with him and be with him. Jesus is knocking, he's still knocking. How do we get God's presence? We open the door, say, come in. And then he eats with us, isn't that beautiful? But then when eating's over, here's some good advice. Have a chat with him. He's got some pretty interesting things to say. Our job, lift Jesus higher. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Do you still sing, lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see? He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Didn't Jesus say, I'll build my church? Our job isn't to take over. Our job is to join and support the building project. I like to say, Team Jesus. As CFC churches, I believe our heart has always been, God, this is to be your church. God, we want to follow you. And I said in the first session, as good as Bill Vasilakis' leadership is, as helpful as Ray Betcher, Bill Osborne, David Smythe, Hans Vortman, and other leaders have been, it's because God's been here that we've enjoyed his blessing. God's been in this place. I reckon Psalm 100, Psalm 100 articulates so clearly the priority of things and our joyful and right understanding and commitment to how things are to be. Come with me to Psalm 100. This is, this is, this is church, guys. Shout. Okay. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. Isn't that nice? We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. That's getting the priorities right. God is God. We're the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. As CFC churches, our heart is to be to love God and our priority to lift Jesus higher. Key number two, God's word. How do we understand that we are connecting with the real God, the real Jesus, and understand his character and conduct? The answer is really simple. We read about him in his book. I kind of have this little saying that the Bible is God in print. You know, in John chapter one, it says that Jesus was the word the word was made flesh in Jesus well I kind of think that God in the Bible is made into print as we read this we get to know who God is 
And you know, if you read a book about a person, you get to know the person. I have read 16 of Bill Hybel's books, the pastor of Chicago Community Church. I've read 16, I, I know the guy because he's so self-disclosing in his books. I know about his struggles, I know about his family, I know his kids' names, I know about all sorts of things about him. One day he is here, I met him in person up in Bill's office and he came up to me, stood there and, and uh, we shook hands and he didn't know, I'm thinking, Bill, I know you. I, I, I've known you for so long. This is the first time I've shaken, but I know all about you. We get to know someone as, as we read about them. If the book is honest, uh, we, we get to know them. We get to know God by reading his book. God reveals himself and touches our lives through his word. People meet God through hearing the word of God. Paul said, faith comes from hearing the message. That's where our faith begins. It's through the Bible that we meet Jesus and hear his words of life. I love this story in Matthew. Jesus had just finished speaking and the crowds were amazed at his teaching. He says amazing things. We should read about them. It's interesting that they said he doesn't speak like the teachers of the law. He speaks with something to say. Man, that's a challenge for preachers, isn't it? Another occasion... Jesus is sharing some heavyweight words and some people thought, too hard, this is all too hard and they started wandering away and Jesus looked at his disciples and says, you guys want to leave too? Peter got it right this time. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's true. Jesus has the words to rule an eternal life. Peter's words are still true. Key number two, be a word-based and word-proclaiming church. In our past, we've always endeavoured to be that. We will into our future. But here's the great responsibility. We need to rightly divide and correctly handle the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one who correctly handles the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God as the one who correctly handles the word of truth. If we don't correctly handle it, it's no longer true. If it's no longer true, it's a lie. We're speaking a lie. If it's the truth that sets us free, lies will imprison us, imprison us in the error of our understanding. Just a bit of useful information. I used to say, the truth sets you free. I now know that it doesn't. What sets you free is application of the truth. I'm dying of thirst. I am absolutely dying of thirst. If I drink this, it'll quench my thirst. That's the truth. If I don't drink it, I'm going to continue to die of thirst. See, the truth is, it can quench my thirst, but unless I drink it, make it my own, it's not going to set me free. We have to make the truth ours. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, and puts them into practice, is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Not just hear, but put into practice. Back to rightly dividing the word of truth because I believe this is so important. This is of the utmost importance in being and building God's church. Paul said, keep the pattern of sound teaching. Paul said, don't turn and learn a different gospel, which really is no gospel at all. Hebrews 13, 9. Do not be carried away by strange teachings. Now, our CRC founder, the man that God used to found the Christian Revival Crusade, the CRC Churches International, Leo Harris, was not into fads and foolishness. And I want to tell you that Bill Vasilakis, Ray Betcher, Bill Osborn, Hans Vortman, David Smythe, initial leaders of the Christian Family Centre, were all mentored by Leo Harris, and we've taken that to heart. Here's a little quote. 
God looks at the heart. We know that. God looks at the heart. He looks at our hearts. But it's also good to have our heads screwed on the right way. <laughs> and it is a learning process. And often a relearning process. Mind renewal. We're told to renew our minds and be conformed to the image of Christ. You know, the preacher doesn't always get it right. And I've put my name amongst them. Two things that come immediately to mind. One time I'm preaching about David and Goliath and faith. And I said, you know, David, when he threw that stone, it didn't matter which way he threw it. God was going to make sure it hit Goliath in the forehead. I said, that's what faith does. That's not true. That's not true. He had practice with his sling. When he's looking after his father's sheep, he put tin cans on the fence posts and, and he could hit them every time. See, we have, to, we have to develop our giftings and then give them to God with faith. Another thing I preached, I can still remember preaching it in the scout hall. I said, isn't it wonderful that when Jesus was flogged 39 times, those 39 stripes represented the 39 major diseases in the world. That's amazing. <laughs> How wonderful is that? Why 39? Because the Jews had a rule that you could only flog a man with 40 stripes. And if the person flogging the man went over, he got flogged. So they always used to just in, in case of a miscount, go to 39 and not 40. Here's the point. The Romans flogged him. They didn't have a rule. You could flog a man till he died. Where did I get that from? Preached it so boldly. I heard it and liked it. The Bible says, we read it, do your best to correctly handle the word of truth. I was doing that. I was doing my best. So forgive me. Paul says, test everything. Hold on to the good. It's important that we do that. And be like the Bereans of Acts 17, 11. They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. You've got to do that. We have to do that. Go back to God's word because this is where life is. This is where God speaks those amazing words of life, eternal life to us. We always need to be open to adjust our course as we see truth with more clarity. I think it's a bit like the blind man that Jesus prayed for and he said, how you doing? He said, I see men uh, as trees walking. Not seeing it clearly. Jesus prayed again. He said, what do you see? I see clearly now. Sometimes we need to go back to Jesus and say, am I getting this right? Because I want to. And, and he'll clarify it to us. Go to Jesus. Key point number two, build on the word of God. God's word is to be the foundation of our lives and our church. I'm going to share this lovely illustration again. You've already noted my Bible. I know. It's a funny color. It used to be when I had it, Originally, it was a beautiful, classic, wine-coloured leather. But it started to wear out and started to crack. So I thought, doesn't look good, I'll, I'll recover it myself. So I bought some tape, put it on, and at the end, I thought, oh, that doesn't look too classy. <laughs> I showed it to Narina and she just looked at me. And I was troubled by that thing, I'm going to have to get it recovered then I had this kind of little word of revelation. Everyone should have a red Bible. <laughs> Every Bible should be read. <laughs> Took a while, didn't it? <laughs> I found peace, and so I still have this lovely <laughs> red Bible. In Paul's words, Ephesians 1.13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. That's it. The word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Having believed, so we hear it. It's the gospel of salvation. 
It's essential to our survival and our revival. And, and I believe I can honestly say, as a local church, we've always endeavoured to be people of the word. Ephesians 1.13 goes on to say, marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That leads to point key number three, and that is to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. We need to be a church that's sealed with the Holy Spirit. We need to be individuals sealed with the Holy Spirit. God comes to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's described as the spirit of life. He's described as the spirit of freedom. See, the word by itself it isn't enough. It needs to be made alive. Unless God's Spirit makes it alive, it's just ink on paper. But uh, when, when God's Spirit comes into it, it's like putting a match to the gas burner that's alight and poof, it's already alive. Or it's switching the switch and the filament and the light globe all of a sudden comes alive. God's Spirit will do that to the Word of God if we give Him chance. Romans 8, 9, if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. As a church, as the Christian Family Centre, we've always proclaimed that we can be born again of God's spirit. We can be filled with God's spirit. We don't just explain God, we experience his presence. Do you sing like we do up at the hills? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. May we make those real words of invitation. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Jesus, in fact, said, you know, this is amazing. He says, you know, it's good that I'm going because unless I go, the Holy Spirit isn't going to come. He said, you'll be born of the Spirit. You'll be empowered by the Spirit. You'll be gifted by the Spirit. He said, he'll be your teacher. He'll be your counselor. He'll be your guide into truth. He'll convict you of sin, encourage in righteousness, and he'll take and will honor me. He'll deliver from me to all I have done and will do for you. We need the Spirit to do that for us. And here's a truth that we have applied at the Christian Family Centre that I personally so appreciate as I look around and I believe that God appreciates. And that is, you can be a Spirit-filled church and a Spirit-filled person and still be, still be a sensible church and a sensible person. See, we have taken seriously the words of Corinthians that say, for God is not a God of disorder but peace. Everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. What difference does the Holy Spirit make? I take John 15, 5 to tell us. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Back to key number one. Without God, we're not going to achieve very much at all. You know, without attachment to the vine, the branch dies. It needs to be fed with the sap that comes up through the roots and, and, and the vine in, in, into the branches. If we stay attached to Jesus, we too will be fed not by the sap that feeds the branch in a tree, but by the Holy Spirit. In a way, the Holy Spirit is our sap. And I do apologize to him for calling him a sap. <laughs> He's okay with that. I checked it out before I came. <laughs> do, you know what a, do you know what a branch is without sap? A stick. Do you know what a church is without the Holy Spirit? Just a stick. You know what we are without the Holy Spirit flowing into our lives? Just, just a, a stick. Now, if the sap is flowing into a branch, while the Spirit is flowing into us, we, we can produce fruit. I have three ornamental pears at home. And just now, they're coming to full blossom. They're starting to look beautiful. White blossom on the branches. Now, I thought for a moment, I know what I'll do. I'll take this stick and I'll cut off a branch Sunday morning before I go to church with the blossoms on it and come down and say, look at the difference. 
God makes. But I couldn't do it. You know why? Because I thought it's not fair to that branch with the blossoms on it. Because if I cut it off in two weeks, it's simply going to be a stick. We need God's Spirit in our lives. We need God's Spirit in our lives. Without Him, without the flow of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, we're just a stick, a log of wood. With the Holy Spirit filling the life of the church, we can be a branch that blossoms, a tree that bears fruit in Jesus' name. Key three, be spirit-filled and spirit-led. I consider, as I look back and as I look forward, I believe that we have survived and revived and will continue to survive and revive as we love God with all our heart, soul and mind, as we obey him and walk in his ways, as we lift Jesus higher for the world to see, as we love, learn and live by God's word, doing our best to write and divide the word of truth, as we are filled with the spirit and sensible, as we live by and keep in step with the Holy Spirit, as we open the door wide and say, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Back to the question I asked at the start of my message. What's it all about? We can change the methods of doing things, but the message stays the same. What is the message? We could say it this way, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's really the message. It's all about God and people, which means God and us. The wonderful connecting be between God and people is love. And God is love. His desire is to express his love, his heart, to people, his human family. Sadly, the family that he loves... His human family have wandered away from the family home and got rather lost. Here's another way of talking about the message. I quote Philip Yancey in his book, Vanishing Grace. Yancey says, In my lifelong study of the Bible, I've looked for an overarching theme, a summary statement of what the whole sprawling book is about. I've settled on this. God gets his family back. From the first book to the last, the Bible tells of wayward children and the tortuous lengths to which God will go to bring them home. May we, as the Christian Family Centre churches, and individual Christians, help and not hinder God get his family back in my conclusion don't get excited it's going on for a little while <laughs> in my three minute spot at the 40 year celebration I said this church is not about Vasilakis, Betcha Osborne or Smythe it's about Jesus now that's true, but there's a but. How wonderful, how encouraging that he invites us along for the ride. How life-changing that God loves us. God wants to get his family back. He wants to save us by his grace. We can be born again into his family. He becomes our father, we his sons and daughters. Life changes, it becomes a journey home. We read about Abraham. He looked forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And then those that follow Abraham, and that can be us. We long for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called our God and has prepared a city for us. Isn't it great that the best is yet to come? 
full salvation is to be realised. What a privilege to be invited along for the ride. God includes us and invites us to walk and work with him. You know, this knowledge answers the two deep cries of the human heart. Do we matter? Do we have meaning? Because God loves us and has a, 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 a purpose for us. Yeah, we matter and we have meaning. So as individuals and a local church, our responsibilities are make it our goal to please him. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, it's easy, guys. What should our goal be? Make it our goal to please him. Simple as that. 1 Peter 4, 8, love each other deeply, and we're to do that. We're to love each other deeply. 1 Peter, use whatever gift we've received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. 1 Corinthians 9.22, become all things to all men so that by all possible means we might be used by God to save them. In Yancey's words, to help God get his family back. Just a little thought process that I've had of late. And this is the finale. I kind of thought, why do we call God all the time? Hello, God. Morning, God. God, we pray. He has a name. Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise be to Yah. He has a nickname, Jehovah. Why do we just call him God? Like, dog is a dog, but we don't say, good morning, dog. <laughs> Sit, dog. We say, good morning, Toby. Sit, Toby. That's if it's his name. We're all, we're all people. We're people. I don't say, good morning, person. <laughs> Hello, person. <laughs> Hello, person. Good morning, person. No. We use their names. So I thought, God, how do you, how, what do you feel about us all saying, God? Because that's what he is. That's what he is and who he is. So I was struggling with this. And then I thought, you know, my father's name is Alan Creswell Smythe. Well, I've never called him that in my life. <laughs> I've never said, good morning, Alan Creswell Smythe. <laughs> my name is David. My kids have never said, good morning, David. David, come here. I've always said to my father, Dad. My kids, Joshua calls me father, Natalie calls me dad, Cassie calls me bumhead, <laughs> affectionately speaking. <laughs> I was in Tassie last week, there for Father's Day. Had my shower, came back to the bed that Noreen had made, and there was a card. Oh, card. Open it up. And Cassie had remembered that it's Father's Day and she said, love your daddy. I didn't mind that she didn't say, David. I'm glad she didn't say, person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, God invites us to call him Father. The Bible says he puts his spirit within us and, and, and we call him Abba Father. And that's an affectionate, emotive, loving way of relating to him. What a privilege to be in God's forever family. To be his son and his daughter. To know him and call him father. The truth is, I believe like we as fathers, love our kids to say, Father, Dad, Daddy if you like. I believe God loves to hear us call him Father. See, the challenge for the church, the challenge for Christian family centered churches, the challenge is that God wants his family back. He wants more people not just to know him as God, but to know him as Father. Church, 
We are the custodians of the most amazing, hope-filled, good news going. It needs to be told. Let's be up for the challenge. I like to think it's why we call ourselves the Christian Family Centre. Amen? Join me as I pray.